<laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> I don't even know what's happening. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the Z170WS. Now, like many things that Asus does, Asus has turned it up to 11. This motherboard has a lot of features, but it's kind of weird this time around. The Z170 chipset is officially a desktop chipset. And what that means is that this motherboard doesn't support a Xeon CPU because the Z170 chipset doesn't support a Xeon. Now, in previous generations, you could get away with running a Xeon and a desktop board and, and I, you know, the i7 with the Xeon chipsets. This time around, the equivalent Skylake Xeon chipset is the C232. And so you can use an i7 or an i5 with that um, or Xeon, but you can't use a Xeon in a Z170 board. This is basically all Intel's doing. So Asus is sort of faced with a conundrum. They're like, well, you know, there are a lot of people that like to work and play on the same hardware. What are we going to do with that? It's like, well, their answer is the Z170 WS. So in this case, WS means more validation, more testing, uh, more features that are more for power users. And so unlike some of the other models from Asus where it's a little bit more geared for the gamer or a little bit more geared for the enthusiast, this workstation board has a lot of those same features, but they have been validated and tested with all kinds of different hardware. So like for us, you know, we've got HDMI capture cards and all sorts of other PCI Express peripherals that are high performance. This thing is packing four by 16 slots. Now that's uh, up to by eight, by eight, by eight, by eight electrical. Um, you can also run by 16 by 16 for a dual graphics configuration. So of course that does support four way uh, SLI and crossfire, which is sort of interesting on Skylake given that Skylake is only 16 PCI Express lanes um, out of the CPU. The way that they do that, of course, is PCI bridging. Now it also has a PCI Express by four expansion slot for additional peripherals, two M.2 slots, one U.2 for NVMe SSDs. There's no SATA Express or anything like that, but it does have six SATA six gigabit per second ports in addition to all that connectivity. Now the Intel Z170 chipset provides six USB 3.0 USB connections. And what they've done with that is also interesting. There are four USB 3.0 ports at the back. Those are uh, connected through an Asmedia USB 3 hub to one of the six ports on the Intel chipset. Four of the six ports go to the front panel USB 3 connectors, and the other one is available in a vertical connector at the midboard. So that USB connector is wired directly into the Intel chipset. In addition to that, Asus also provides two USB 3.1 10 gigabit per second ports. Those are provided by an Asmedia controller, one USB Type A and one USB reversible Type C. So at the back panel, we've got our optical SPDIF HDMI 2.0 connected through the Skylake graphics controller, of course. Now, for HDMI 2.0, you will have to get the updated Intel drivers. Intel out the gate with the Skylake stuff has been a little squirrely. If you've been following my reports on that, I'm trying to keep up with it because Skylake graphics are actually not bad, but the drivers, oh, the drivers. We've also got HDMI 1.2 port. Now between HDMI 2.0 and the DisplayPort 1.2 connection, you can drive two 4K displays off of this, so that's pretty cool. Then you got four USB 2.0 ports for your USB 2.0 peripherals. You've got your uh, USB BIOS flashback button and your you know your Q code logger diagnostic buttons uh, on the back for flashing. You can upgrade CPU support after the fact. All, all, all the stuff that we've come to know and love from Asus and their USB BIOS flashback feature. Then we've got those Asmedia USB 3.1 ports I was telling you about. The four USB 3.0 ports, now these are connected through an Asmedia USB 3.0 hub. Then we've got two Intel Gigabit NICs, one i210 and one i219. We've got a Realtek ALC 1158 channel high definition audio codec that's featuring Crystal Sound 3. This is also 112 dB signal to noise ratio play stereo playback at the line out jack. And we've got 104 dB signal to noise ratio at the line in jack. This also supports the Blu-ray BD audio layer compression DTS studio sound and DTS connect. Now in terms of memory support, this thing does support up to 64 gigabytes of memory up to DDR4-3466. That's what's been validated. And in terms of the ASUS specific features that they've packed onto this thing, it's got the ASUS Pro Clock technology, which is the full base clock range adjustment. This is the extra sort of special sauce that ASUS has. Uh, if you want to do the really super extreme uh, base clock overclocking, well, this has got the, the clock driver to support that. It's also got five-way optimization so that you can do sort of the whole system optimization with one click if you're into the five-way optimization. It also has DigiPower Plus, the TPU and EPU. Those are those are physical switches. Uh, it also has Fan Expert 3. Uh, the fan connections we'll get into a little bit more in a minute. The Turbo app, which is uh, a performance tuning, network tuning app. So there's like a LAN turbo utility that's uh, priority queuing that runs on top of the Intel integrated NICs. So you've also got the Easy XMP switch. 
the memo K button key express, which can, you know, one key, you know, uh, which can one key take you into the UEFI or whatever you want to do. There's also a direct key header. And of course, USB 3.1 boost, which uh, improves the performance of USB 3.1 peripherals by making them more like SCSI devices, like block transfer devices. So let's do a quick tour around the board. Starting at the top of the board, you can see that there are the two eight pin CPU power headers. Now, only one of those is required. If you're gonna be doing extreme overclocking or you know a lot of other stuff with this motherboard that may require just ridiculous amounts of 12 volt power, then you would need the other one. But by and large, most people will only need one. Now, if you're going to run a four-way configuration uh, with SLI or something like that, then you would probably also need to supply power to the six-pin 12-volt header uh, that's located just above the PCI Express slots. There you'll find another fan header. Then we've got our four uh, by 16 physical PCI Express slots. Now the two gray slots are by 16 electrical. The two black ones are by eight electrical. And then you've got this little PCI Express by four, which is connected through the DMI resources uh, sort of in the middle. Then also included in the layout here are two M.2 slots, which support up to 110 millimeter length M.2 cards. Now this does support RAID, so you can do M.2 RAID and, and all sorts of fun stuff with that if you really want to. Um, coming around the uh, bottom edge of the board, you can see that Asus has done the audio isolation on the PCB. Uh, you've got the Crystal Sound Shield and then, the, uh, and then you've got the Nishikon capacitors. At the bottom edge of the board, you've got the SPDIF out header. You've also got the front panel uh, out header. Then next to that, you've got an RS-232 header. Now, mine was bundled with an included RS-232 breakout cable depending on the model that you get and the configuration that you get. I'm not sure if the RS-232 breakout cable would be included. We've got our Q code readout LED next to that, the TPM header, in case you want to use a TPM module for you know storing your cryptographic keys securely. Uh, power and reset, physical switches, um, some jumpers for allowing CPU over voltage and some other stuff. Next to that, we've got our only USB 2.0 header. So if you've got an internal device like a water pump or something like that, or a power supply that plugs directly into USB for monitoring and stuff, you can use this header to connect that. Then we've got our first of two USB 3.0 headers. We've got a vertical USB 3.0 slot. So if you want to use a memory stick internally or boot from a memory stick, if you're going to run, you know, VMware ESXi or something like that off of a USB stick, you can use that internally with this. We've got another uh, chassis fan header. And then we've got our front panel connector. Uh, just above the front panel connector, you've got this sort of light connector. This is the Asus fan breakout controller. So if you want more fan headers with more control through the UEFI, you can get this little peripheral from Asus plug in there and have even more direct fan control. Uh, coming around the front edge of the board, we've got our U.2 connector, which is for our NVMe SSDs. Then we've got our six SATA six gigabit per second ports, a clear CMOS button, another fan header, another USB 3.0 header, our ATX power connections, another fan header, and our mem OK button. At the top edge of the board, we've got a connector for a water pump. So this is a 12 volt header that provides a connection for a water pump so it doesn't use up one of your nice PWM slash DC control fan headers. And then we've got our main CPU fan header. And then next to that, we've got our optional CPU fan header. So if you're running a tower cooler and a push-pull configuration, then you can control uh, the both fan speeds simultaneously from one setting in the UEFI on both of those fan headers. Now coming back around to the mid board, just above the second by 16 electrical slot, we've also also got our Thunderbolt header. Now Thunderbolt is sort of getting exciting in the PC world and this is compatible with the Thunderbolt 2 EX uh, PCI Express interface card if you pick up one of those um, from Asus. So if you want to run this thing with Thunderbolt, you totally can. It's totally supported on Skylake. All the stuff that you need to do that is right there. Now I know what you're thinking. Did he count to five or six fan headers? Well, to be honest, I lost track myself. <laughs> So the reality is you've got four chassis fan headers, one CPU fan header, one other CPU fan header, and then one water pump connector. And that's what you've got in the way of CPU fan headers for this particular thing. Now in terms of board aesthetics, it is a nice understated sort of two-tone gray configuration. I like the aesthetics of this. Uh, the, uh, the one PCI Express by four slot is a very slight brown color. And I'm not really sure that that color is used elsewhere on this board. If it is, it's too subtle. I'm not really sure why that slot's brown. Why am I even talking about that in a motherboard review? The color honestly does not matter, unless it's fluorescent pink, and then it's really bad. In terms of heat management, the voltage regulation componentry has a substantial heat sink, both along the back, and then of course the north bridge has a heat pipe. Now, because Asus has got to rock the heat pipe in order to keep everything cool. It is nice and low profile though, so if you did actually run this thing with four graphics cards, it looks as though the north bridge would actually get enough cooling because of the heat pipe uh, is sort of taken above the very top card. So 
as long as you've got sufficient cooling around your CPU socket, take note, people that are using an all-in-one loop or a closed-loop water cooler, that you've got enough airflow around your CPU socket in order to dissipate the heat from the Northbridge and from the VRM componentry. Just something to keep an eye on as you're, as you're specking out your system and, and building it. One thing that this board has that has been popular the last generation or so from Asus are physical switches for things. So like when you install the memory, the memory by default is going to operate at 2133 because that's the JDEC standard for DDR4. Technically anything faster than that is overclocking. You know, Intel doesn't really validate it, whatever. But the motherboard's validated for much faster speeds, and you can get a, a nice little performance bump using faster components. And so uh, one of the things is called the extreme memory profile. And so the extreme memory profile lets you run your memory at a faster speed uh, once you get past the default speed. Like once it's working at 2133, if the memory has an extreme memory profile, you can ask it to run faster. Now in the UEFI, normally you would toggle a setting in the UEFI and change it. Some people don't like that. So Asus has included a physical switch that will do that for you. That's the easy XMP. There's actually a series of three switches at the front edge of the motherboard here that control various aspects of power utilization, overclock, and, and sort of the, uh, the features that are there. So you can use these physical switches to control your XMP and your overclock settings, uh, which is maybe handy if you want to fiddle with things with physical switches. Um, and then it's like, oh, maybe I'm having a problem. Maybe I'm doing a troubleshooting procedure. Uh, I'm just going to flip the switches off to take everything sort of back to normal. You You've got that option with this motherboard. The Asus Memo K button, if you haven't seen that before, basically uh, one of the things that can go horribly wrong with a system build is something is, does not work with your memory or you put the memory in the wrong slots and it won't post or you know whatever the problem happens to be. You can reseat your memory and press the Memo K button, which will signal the motherboard to do a diagnostic on your memory and the LED will glow red, you know, depending on what, what the problem might be. And you might also get a Q code readout if you try to boot it up and it doesn't work. Check the manual for the, the particulars around that, that function. But when you're doing diagnostics or you're upgrading memory or changing memory out in a system, Memo K is really sort of handy. You can also use it to reset your memory configuration. If you had a really extreme memory overclock and the only thing you want to reset is your memory configuration, you can use Memo K to do that. Overall, though, in terms of packing a ton of features onto this board, it's, it's really, I think, a workstation is kind of a misnomer. It's not really, you know, for me, workstation is error correcting RAM and a Xeon CPU. And it's not really... You know, Asus really couldn't do anything about it short of use a Xeon chipset, but it would be problematic to cram all this stuff into using a Xeon chipset. And so this is a workstation board aimed at enthusiasts that also need to be able to get a little bit of work done. So overall, uh, you know, it's, it is workstation. Just know that it's different from workstation class products previously. And there are other workstation products that actually use a Xeon chipset that you can get from Asus. But in terms of peripheral connectivity and all the features that are on this board, it's really hard to beat it, especially on the Skylake platform. I mean, holy crap, they got by 8 by 8 by 8 by 8 for uh, the PCI Express configuration. So not necessarily for running four-way graphics, but, you know, in our case, we'll run a single graphics card and then two or three HDMI capture, especially for like one of our open broadcaster broadcasting rigs, especially with the office, especially with, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff in terms of like being able to switch between cameras and doing things in terms of capture having this much PCI Express connect connectivity on a relatively low cost Skylake board uh, is sort of a huge feature. You know, normally you would have to go with something that has, you know, 40 PCI Express lanes when you're talking X99. And then it's like, wow, really an X99 capture computer? Jeez, I mean, that seems like a little bit of overkill, but it's because you need the PCI Express connectivity. But with, with a board like this, it actually suits that use case really well. So overall, Asus, I think, has put a really, uh, a really nice board together. Um, and I like what I've seen of it so far. Now, of course, I've got to put it through the paces and I've got to do some additional Linux testing. I did not have a chance to do... A, a completely comprehensive set of Linux testing on this. I did actually get to test Thunderbolt with it a little bit using an AccuSys Thunderbolt disk enclosure. That actually worked out really well. I was, I was really surprised by that. Uh, I think Thunderbolt peripherals in, in PC are sort of coming of age if consumers show interest for it. They're sort of a low cost way to do high performance peripherals with it. I think I'm gonna build a Linux workstation around it and sort of see what kind of trouble I can get into with it. So if you're thinking about getting one of these, or if you got one of these and you got some feedback you want to share with the rest of the group, well, head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later. <laughs> We've got a real tech ALC 11. <laughs> I don't even know what's happening.